it's physically show to you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the choreographer shows it. Yeah, thank you. The choreographer shows the dancers, or, or um, some dancers show each other, you know, so it's, but it's quite involved. Somebody was also talking about the interpretation. The lady is not here today. He was asking about the interpretation. Um, because she said, how, how, you know, if you, how well, could people have different interpretations? Because, you know, you write down one thing and have different interpretations, but you can. Because interpretation is something else. Interpretation is not free, free movement. Interpretation is, is an expression and how you use the music, you know. But the movements are always the same. So it's just in case you're thinking of that as well. <laughs> okay, um, got the easiest thing today. And I'm going to be dancing with two things. <laughs> okay, um, well, welcome back. Uh, your sticklers <laughs> for the punishment. Um, we will uh, just go on with the dynamic markings. Um, that is, again, the contraction from yesterday. Contraction is also a dynamic. Okay, so if we, that's why I'm redoing that as well, going on from there. Um, in her book, again I talk about Anne Hutchinson Guest, um, because she wrote this fantastic book about all the different notation systems. And uh, she's still alive, she's 102 I think. And <laughs> she was married to a, a, a famous writer, Ivor Guest. And um, she's, uh, she still teaches as well. <laughs> um, Okay, she, she said that the translation of four-dimensional movement, time that we have said before, just to remind you, um, four-dimensional movements, time being the fourth dimension, into signs written on two-dimensional paper. And she also stated that the fifth dimension, that of dynamics, should be considered and accepted as an integral part. Dynamics is very important um, because you cannot move, really, without dynamics. Um, two other ladies, Blom and Chaplin, talk about dynamics as an interaction of force with time. The two play together, it results in action in the body. Every movement is dynamic, it exists over time and has been achieved by using force. So dynamic has a background of force and you have different types of force and different degrees of force. Um, they continue to say that movement qualities of the um, am I, yeah, of the distinctly observable att att attributes or characteristics produced by dynamics and made manifest in movement. Um, was this the previous one? Yeah, the previous one. Oh. Yes, you've done that. The previous one I said, quotation um, point, and how she's in this. That one, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is the one I've just, yeah, just said. Yeah. Okay, so the next one is the movement qualities are the distinctly observable attributes of characteristics produced by dynamics and made manifest in movement. We all love fabulous jobs and exist and the exciting turns. We keep talking about that. And we are most appreciative of, of other technical powers that may seem the norm amongst talented and well-trained dancers. We are moved by the visual, emotional, and dramatic qualities of story, story ballets. The varied contemporary approaches using ballet and other techniques draw our attention. Apart from appreciating what we see, not many of us are able to explore further to find out what it is about this spectacle of dance that fascinates and excites us. Using notation to describe the understanding of the particular qualities within movement is to almost make it visible and tangible. Because um, dance, dance is known as an ephemeral art because the moment the movement happens, it's gone. 
and no movement, no performance is the same ever because the movement in the time is not the same, so it is ephemeral, it disappears. So notation, writing it down, makes it tangible and it makes it lost. Um, so the established dance styles have their inherent dynamic patterns, which the performer learns and then performs instinctively. But to identify these dynamic patterns and put them on paper needs critical observation. And that's the most important part of it. For the dancers, the challenge is to continually identify and acquire new styles which they have to interpret in various types of choreographic works, whether it is classical or contemporary styles or hybrids of these. And the dancer learns <coughs> new ways of, of moving and interpretation with each choreographer. In dealing with any choreographer, the dancer is often continually pushed into new directions to learn and accept different ways of moving, sometimes according to the choreographer's personal style of movement, and uh, usually to the choreographer's personal style of movement and, and the choreographer's own feeling of what he, wants, he or she wants to put across. The dynamics within the dancer's body, known, uh, the dancer's known technique, may not be enough to cope with the specific choreographer's ideas at the start. And that is what the endless rehearsals are for, where the creation and interpretation of the choreography can materialize at the same time. And usually a ballet is written in five weeks, choreographed from five weeks onwards. There are some choreographers that work much longer. Um, but the classical ballet is, is normally done in, in, in five weeks minimum. And it's usually quite pressured because if they, if they have different casts, they have to keep rehearsing the different casts to understand the same intentions that the choreographer wants. When it comes to writing it all down, the notator's eye has to be trained so as to decide what relevant detail must be included in the score. If you remember the video yesterday with Amanda asking when she was talking about Dwayne McGregor, where she says she puts stuff away and then she, you know, she decides what she has to learn and she just continues notating and she does video as well and then works at home and then she comes back the next day in the same process and then a week later he says, right, now we can put it together. So there's all that stuff that she has to know that she's decided that's what he wants. So it usually only happens if a, a choreologist or a notator has worked with a choreographer for a long time. They understand where the choreographer is coming from. And I think the worst thing is that he doesn't choreograph with music. Like he doesn't. He, 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 it's very difficult then. And then in the end he puts the music together. He decides then what music fits the choreographer. There are some works of his on, on, on YouTube and it's unbelievable stuff. Of importance here is that the notation, notation's purpose is not just as a reminder towards a rerun with the same cast at a later stage. It is also the guide to teach a totally new cast. In addition, there may, there may be a different notator or a reconstructor who then teaches the ballet from the score. So it has to really be written you know, in such a way that the other notator also understands it. I'd like to show you a short repetitive sequence I recorded in African dance class in 2002. specifically in one way, but when they do it, 
they do it their own way, which is still not what is required. The teacher will rehearse and rehearse and rehearse until they deal with leaders. Say now, in the next one, take particular note of the teacher showing the arms crushing in the jump, which only two dancers have picked up. Because then they keep showing that. But some are doing this and some are doing this, but he shows that, which is the most important thing that he shows. And only two people pick it up. And that happens in choreography in a company. As the choreographer will show something and only a few people will realize what he really wants. So that's why it has to be repeated and repeated and repeated. So this is this. rendition of what the teacher choreographer requires, um, the explanations and analyses are often the best indications. Even then, each dancer will pick up something different and interpret it according to their facilities. My notation of the sequence, as with all other notations, was making very fine notes from what Maxwell Rani, the teacher, was doing as well as describing it in each successive class. There is, however, one danger in watching movement in slow motion. One may get caught up in overanalyzing and identifying movements that appear in between the real accented or important ones. So one has to be careful of taking it from slow motion. You may recall from the African dance section of yesterday's lecture that we dealt with hops and skin lines. Let's take a moment and recap. Today we have, we start with the bent legs, and then a hop is just on place, but onto the balls of the feet. And then in B, we've got starting the same way with that deep bend, and then the hop goes forward. And in C, we've got the hop and the skim. So it goes forward and skim forward, see, into the open position. And here is a notation for this specific jump sequence from the video I've just shown. So that's exactly from what the video they did on the video. So if you look in, in, in example A, the notation is stripped bare of arm movements. So take, the arm movements are at the bottom, taken them away at the top. Um, and also some dynamic markings. I've, I've stripped that for the moment. And example B shows leg and arm movements with, with the dynamic uh, markings included. But we'll come back to the, the dynamic markings are actually these down here. So I forgot I've got the pointer. Um, so, but we'll come back to that when we discuss the particular dynamic markings. One has to experience uh, the movement and the unfamiliar dynamics through one's own body as much as possible. Because if you're notating it, you've got to actually know what it is that the choreographer or, the, or that specific dance needs. So you've got to experience that feeling within your own body. Movement quality, rhythm, and tempo are naturally fundamental to movement dynamics. 
the various interpretations of the same movements may also influence the dynamics of the choreography. In honoring the specific intentions of the choreographer, sometimes more clarification in the reproduction of a dance work is more successfully achieved by adding specific dynamic markings to the notation. And that's where one has to be so careful as a notator that you make sure that you include those. In the previous lecture, I referred to Martha Graham and her famous contraction, and that's an interesting photograph, where Matt Mattox defines, defined it as um, the gathering together of any muscle or group of muscles from a relaxed position to a hard conditioned muscle, and the term is often applied to the reduction in size between the ribcage and the pelvis. So it's like that. So this gets shorter. And because the ribcage is pushed back and the pelvis forward with, with that contraction in the stomach. But we'll come back to it. And Robert Cohen says, it is strange that this movement to curve the spine, and Robert Cohen was a contemporary teacher and also a choreographer, and he said, it is strange that this movement to curve the spine, the contraction, should not have been included in dance training until the 1920s, with the advent of contemporary and jazz techniques, and yet is also used in ballet. Strange because it is a very human movement that has always been used in all kinds of dance. As a dramatic gesture, not only can it be extremely expressive of pain and sorrow, but also of joy and laughter. So everything, we also used to, always used to talk about everything, all emotions, and every idea within the dance and within in, in interpretation comes from the solar plexus. So that if you feel it there before, you can actually express it. You can't, a lot of people tend to try and do it in their faces and everywhere else, but not from inside. Um, here is a sequence that involves a small and a large contraction, which we have seen before. Uh, so this is the, oh, what am I doing? Uh, which one's the pointer? Oh, the middle. So here's the small contraction. This releases it, and that is the large contraction. So the small contraction is only really here in the stomach, the stomach part, where the navel sort of is. And then it releases by just drawing a straight line. And then the other one is the large contraction, meaning it involves from the shoulders, in fact, up to the knees, because you know, it's that whole area here. Okay. Um, yeah, here, when, when the contraction releases, you've got the, um, yeah, the, the, the um, taking the, uh, cleaning it up, not you know, releasing the contraction. We just use a little straight line to say it's not a contraction anymore. It would be a similar thing with the larger contraction. On count three, the legato line, which you see at the top, which we mentioned yesterday, indicates that the movement for the position on count four has started happening. So that contraction is already coming from three, four. Um, you may recall from lecture two, two days ago, that the legato line was mentioned very briefly. Its purpose is to show the movements under it happening smoothly, first of all, and over time. The pulse beat under it is necessary to show count three as the body frame is empty, and to show that the contraction commences. So by count four, we've reached the final position which shows a larger contraction and the knees bend deeper. So here we've got a slight bend in the knees and then the larger contraction is deeper. The hands have moved up to finish at shoulder height. The elbows are bent at the same height. And you will see that those little curves 
is again they're facing outwards. But I'll talk again about the two little dots there. The next slide shows an explanation of what happens on count four of the sequence. In A, in the, the front, the in front hand sides each has that curve attached to them of which the open sides face outward. That means the wrists are facing outward. Don't think of the hands, don't think of the cup of the, of the palm of the hands. It's actually the wrist facing outwards from the wrist. Um, each one of the wrists in B outward has a dot attached to the apex of the curve, and this refers to the hands being pulled back from the wrist. So actually from the wrist, it, it pulls back from the wrist. That's why the dot is attached. On the, and that's why we talk about the wrist direction. In C, as I've said in the previous slide, the final position shows a larger contraction, and the knees are bent deeper. The hands have moved up from count three to finish at shoulder height. So that was the same as before. Okay. Within every movement there is an underlying dynamic, whether it is pre-decided or occurring on the spur of the moment. With some movements you cannot perform them properly or even at all unless certain dynamics are employed. For instance, in the case of the popular pirouettes, you have to have a dynamic otherwise it doesn't perform, it doesn't work. Some spectators get very excited with the number of turns in one execution or speed within a few turns, where others may settle for a different aesthetic or a different dynamic, like the balance in a slowing down pirouette finishing in an arabesque, whether it's on demi point or on point, and then just sort of hanging in the air. That sometimes is even more exciting than 10 fast pirouettes. But it's all a different dynamic and all exciting within its own time. Unfortunately, I cannot show you any examples, but if you scout around on YouTube, you might find quite a few. Like I said, I can't actually just paste YouTube uh, things here because you're pay, paying for the lectures. So there's a copyright rule. Um, and also, one can't just do it without all the correct permissions. Um, in order to achieve a certain mood in a solo or pas de deux, specific dynamics are required. It is usually most satisfactory when the dynamic of the movement lines up with the dynamic of sound and rhythm, which is often the case, which causes the particular inspiration behind the execution. The mood or dynamic of the music may determine the mood of the choreographer's required movement, and that is often his or her true inspiration. No performance can ever be the same, and that is why one does not only rely on retaining the required demand dynamic, but the performer might find the search of new inspiration in the moment. And that is the beauty of performance. Because you often find in an opening night, everything is fantastic, and the second night it's like, it just doesn't feel right, you know? And it's often the sort of thing, the search of the moment, it's different in every performance, and it's often unexpected whatever happens, you know, whether you have more or less, it's just a strange thing. Um, the choreographer and dancers are a team, establishing the mechanics and dynamics. Sometimes there's an inert understanding of the dynamics required in some choreography, other times it may need particular analysis. The choreographer and dancers can spend much time to work out the mechanics and its effects on the desired results. But within that ongoing process, there is also the possibility of new discoveries. The input of the dancers can be identified through their particular talents, and perhaps that is why the choreographer had chosen them. There's always like a two-way thing there. Some choreographers are clear with what they want. Others may not show any approval until after many more creative rehearsals. So for the notator, it can be either a nightmare or a wonderful journey of discovery. But remember, during the whole process, something has to be notated. In fact, a lot. Sometimes the choreographer may want to come back to a previous idea, which the dancers may have forgotten. And then what? The notator has to remember it. The notator gathers as much information as possible, and in this process, a small video camera is often useful 
as Amanda Isles said about working with Wayne McGregor in the video I showed yesterday. I, I made it uh, a habit also to use the video sometimes, not for myself, for the moment when it was choreographed, because a performance video is something totally different. But I remember in one, one rehearsal of a certain ballet that Veronica Paper had redone, and there was a line, a girl moving along a line of men, and she used to do like just a release of the leg and then just step around and do something else and then go up and just a release of the leg. And in this particular rehearsal, Veronica changed it to a developer. So she would go there, a developer, and then to the next thing and a developer. And the next day of the rehearsal, the dancer did the same as what she did before. And Veronica said, did I change that yesterday? So I said, yes, you did a developer. And the dancer said, I didn't. I said, of course you did. I said, you want to see the video? <laughs> you know, so that is another thing in your defense. You have to also be able to say, of course, because you know, they sometimes think, oh, you're just writing down anything that you think it should be. Um, movement quality, rhythm, and tempo markings are fundamental to movement dynamics. And as Benish movement notation developed, these not only became built into the notation, but as more clarification was required, it became necessary to add the application of dynamic markings for inclusion in a score, when and where specifically necessary. You can't just assume that they, that they will interpret it with certain dynamics. You have to, because you then honor the choreography if you include it in the score. Okay, the words, like stress and emphasis became synonymous with pressure, like pressure cooker there, tension, and where am I now? And accents. So accents are always very important. And tension within the body at certain times, and there's pressure at certain things, you know, with certain movements as well, especially in Pas or with more people working together. These markings are mainly used above state as an added feature to indicate the dynamics within the movement or action already notated. This example you have seen before, remember the, the Grand Batman to the side? In fact, in the second lecture, and it comes down closing. Uh, but now with an added feature above the frame, the little triangle that indicates an accent. So it goes, but it's it's an inaudible accent, so you don't hear the noise. So you just see the action is accented. Okay. Um, the fact that it is not colored in means that it is inaudible. In other words, it is a sharp movement that does not make a noise as opposed to the audible accent we see in the next example. Here yeah, the right leg is lifted and stamped down when closing into the first position, thereby making a noise. For this we've got the audible accent, much like a soldier coming to attention, and that's the action. So the closing has a noise, you have to make a noise. Here yeah, we've got um, an example of, of using the inaudible accent. Um, we, we're starting with the normal position in first. We do the grand back bar, is an accented grand back bar to the front. It comes down, but it is not accented when it comes down. Why? Because we've got something here which is an H in front of it. Now that will identify H we use for head. A we use for arms, C for legs, D for foot. There's a whole lot of things like that which is a bit more complicated. So H is for head. So it says when the leg comes down, the head moves, the head moves with an accent, but the, the, the leg doesn't. It's not easy to do. But some movements in, in dance are like that. And then, of course, then you've got the plie and the stretch. It's, it's again normal. Here we've got uh, an inaudible and an audible accent working together. We start again in parallel. We step forward with an accent. 
inaudible. We slammed up with an audible accent. And here, we've got a repeat of that with the other foot. Now, we don't need to write the, the other foot going up there because it basically says close it and close it. So you use minimal movement to close it again. And then in the last book of movement is up again with an accent. So the movement is accented, but you don't hear it. Here we've got the audible rebound. And the rebound is like a diamond in the shape of a diamond. And a rebound is normally something that does this. Or this. Something like that. That's a rebound. Okay. Um, so let me just. Okay. So we've got um, the first movement is the accent, like we've got before, the accent. And now we've got a rebound that's colored in, so it's a noisy one. So it goes, but it doesn't go quickly. The, the legato line says you go to and. So you, it's not just a close and or a close and up in the legato. It rebounds into the and, rebounds. So the, the movement is very subtle, but it is important. And then on count three, you've got a rebound again when you close, and we have a, a rule that if we've got a repeat of that, of the rebound, and of the same movement, we don't actually have to write that again. So if you just see rebound, rebound it, what was before was a rebound with a foot, so then you would have to rebound again with the foot, and then have an accent on the last count. And here we have in B, if we close and we use the legato line with a rebound similar, similar to this one, and it's a T, which is quicker, so your rebound will go with the, with the music. So it can either go one T, one and, or one T. So it's qualified by the music. Here we've got a very quick, quick rebound action. And this one is because we see the pulse beat, and we've got, that's not a, a legato line at the top there. It's a linking line. And here you see uh, the pulse beat's got a cross out. It means that it happens almost simultaneously. This one happens the accent is on the beat, and the rebound happens after, so you go, but it's very quick, so it's, it's not, it goes, so quick, it's almost you can't identify it by, by rhythm. So the second one is that the rebound goes, one, damn. So it's on, then on the accent is where the, where the foot is lifted. Here we've got the inaudible rebound, um, this you have to watch carefully because, again, we've got a similar situation where with the foot, you have to lift it a little bit in order to put it down again. Here, we, there's a partial straightening of the knees when you go. So if you, you don't need to write every little movement in again because it's going to be too complicated. This just says rebound just partially because you've got to go down again. If you wanted to come straight, you have to write the straight legs in. Take the knees away, in between. Here we've got the inaudible rebound, again, which is um, with the and, so again with the legato line, so it would go and, one and to straighten. So it doesn't go just straight, it's one and. Rebound is like a feeling of it just starts rebounding out of the plie. And here we've got a sequence where we've got this with if you look at the, the legs, the legs you understand now. The the rebound to straight, the rebound from there to straight, uh, to the end, and here the rebound is a bit quicker because 
that's in the subbeat just after the first pulse. The, the pulse. So what happens then is that it, um, you've got the arm movements there as well. Okay, so the arms go will also go from there. They because the re that that talks about everything that's there. It talks about the knees and the arms. So the arms would go rebound to front, rebound to side, rebound to front, rebound to side. So it's that kind of movement, which is often used in contemporary. And here we've got it says here C4 rebound again. That's an indication. That uh, we've, we divide the legs and the arms up in two, three, uh, two, four, uh, three, two, you know, and halves and everything, and the, the legs as well, and the arms. So that says the knees. C4 stands for the knees. So it says the C4, the knees will only rebound while the arms won't. The arms will go down. So the legs will rebound. It's quite tricky to do, but it does happen in, in movement. And there you see, you see the arms, so it says plie, and you've got a lot, 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 lot of line, so the arms will rebound to do that, to do, do, do that, but the legs work. The arms will go that and the legs will just move up. The arms will rebound, the legs will just straighten. So it's, it's, it's the sort of thing that you find when somebody else asked about the interpretation. Those are the things that you that often defines the interpretation, is how the dancer understands that finer quality of, of the dynamic. And here we've got, okay, the normal step. We've got a normal step here coming forward, onto like we did yesterday, or from there, this one, we're stepping back onto the right foot. Okay. Here we've got a little thing and another one over there. That says it's, it opens from the bigger side and it closes towards where it's going. It says it's greater than. So you're actually going to go greater than. Or a bigger step than a normal step. Because a normal step would be over the arc. So a greater one would be a little bit further. Often you see people walk like, like that. Especially the men. You see them walk like a little bit greater than. The girls would go <laughs> stay on the same one. Okay, here we've got a contemporary dance move. And this is a step, step line. So it's all stepping forward. I'll talk about those repeat sizes. Now we did uh, mention that yesterday, didn't we? Yeah. Um, so that goes one da da to six eight. You go down in the woods today, da 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 so that is actually what they call contemporary runs. So you go okay, across the room. Now, here at the bottom, we've got the greater than sign. So that would mean you go, you're going to be moving more. So it's going to be more of a uh, uh, being blown by the wind. And then you've got those repeat signs with the X saying it repeats as many times and usually it's the sort of thing that goes across the room from corner to corner and then repeats continuously from the other corner. A forward jump, here we've got from there, we did the jumps already, I would jump onto that one. Now that same exercise you can also do in a jump but it's a different feel. So it also goes onto the ball of the foot, so flatten it on the ball, but the jump would go <laughs> it's like you know running over hot coals, for instance. So it'll give a different dynamic, a different feel to it. Here we've got greater than. So you'd be jumping over coals and you'd go <laughs> more like that. Okay. And now we've got a normal forward one which goes. But now it says with upward emphasis. This little sign means with upward in emphasis. So you're actually going to go <laughs> So it's, it's a different dynamic again. Okay.
And here we've got greater than and upwards. So that goes. <laughs> it's like you're running like hell. <laughs> And dance does have that. You know, when you do the manages around the room, or people run just on stage, and they just run, you have different dynamics. And sometimes the choreographer requires those different dynamics, because they want a different look to it. Whew, that's not fit. <laughs> now, this is the slow motion again. Back to the same. See, they shows the game. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, these kind of exercises just go on and on and they fall, go from the other side at the same time and then they, like a normal class, a ballet class or a dance class does that. Now, let me come back to the African dance step, that specific step, which is the hop forward, slide open and jump forward. But what you see here are two knees, and they're up here. They're in the place of, of where the hips are. But you don't see the feet. That means the feet are behind. They are, the feet are being masked. Like yesterday we had something with the arms, where we only see the elbows. That means the hands are masked. The hands are in front of them. The same here. So they're jumping up, and the feet are up here. At the, at the pinnacle of the jump, on that accent. Okay, and now here we put the arms. Arms cross, cross in front on the first hop. Then on the scheme they go down. On the jump they go up, wide, and then they come down again when you land. Okay, and it just goes continues to say, <laughs> With that dynamic of going, I can't demonstrate this thing, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a little while. <laughs> so, and also this, just to go back to, I think, oops, we bri briefly mentioned, if I want to fall now. What have I done? Oh, um, this is the anacrusis because that's, that is not a full bar. So whenever we have less than a full bar, it becomes an anacrusis in, in music as well, which happens before the beginning of the first bar. Remember, this, this has no time value. Only when the movement starts is there a time value. So there could be an introduction, often we write an introduction as well. Um, because we dun 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 So we would include that to say there's an introduction of so many bars. Um, so that's the anacrusis which is very important. Um, and we, we've got the repeat signs which in music we don't do uh, the same thing. In music, you have a repeat sign, but you go on to the next. You can repeat, but you don't leave space for the repeat. In dance, we have to leave space for the repeat within the notation. Because there might be something different happening, happening in the repeat with a different arm or something. There's always a change. But in music, there's not no space. Remember, it says end of that section with a repeat, 
and in the next year's social, but just left to repeat somewhere in between. <laughs> so dance, we leave space for it. Okay, we've got effort levels of movement. Um, now these actually come from music. The same, the F, double F, triple F. So we use it in, in dance for more effort than normal, with the single F, the double, for more, more effort than, for much more effort than normal, the triple F for maximum effort, and then the single P for less effort than normal. So you can use it in, your, in the body movement as well. So you can be doing something with F, or double F, or triple F, or P, double P, Triple P. You also use MP and MF as in music as well, but rarer than, than in this case, than in the, this case with, with the three. Here we start with stepping forward. Okay, I'll just go through the movement first. We step forward greater than, further than normal. So you step, come back with accent, bring it down to tondu. We take it up again. And then we take it normally on a fondue and then close it here. Now, we've got a P there at the end. So this you understand greater than, accented, normal, accented, down, soft in the closing. So you don't just go a normal smooth, you go soft. So you have to emphasize soft because it's a dynamic that you might not be aware of it, but the in the work that you see on the stage, it's full of so many, so many dynamics that you, some of the dancers don't often do what the choreographer requires, or they don't get there yet, but there are those differences in dynamic. It's not just force and no force. Here we've got um, a similar thing, um, but we've also got something different. We do it with, with a, a rebound, so we've got step forward, Greater than, we do accented grand battement, rebound up, and a soft closing. Re rebound up, soft closing. Not just closing. Okay. Can I go on? Okay. So remember that these effort levels that we use, they only last for one frame. <coughs> They wouldn't be carried on unless we do it, we make the combination like in D. So they last for that one frame if you write. They, they're not written in a red bracket like that. I just did that so you could see. They are just right, written as double F above the stage. So um, then the effort levels can be extended to last over more frames by combining the effort letters with an opening bracket. So you take, you know, you understand opening and closing brackets. Um, so the opening bracket would be, like I said, I've lost the, the, the ones on this notation. So there would be an opening bracket that's the opposite to that one, and it combines with the P. The opening bracket with the P would be the opening bracket here, and the P would be there. So the opening bracket, which is the other way around from that one, would then combine with the P, and it becomes that. So the P is where the opening bracket would have been. Okay. But to say that it's actually soft, it has it, it, it's just combined so from here onwards until it's cancelled at the end. So that whole phrase from the retire, from that contact, which we remember we spoke about the contact on this waist, is that is a retire contact side of the knee. From the it, it goes softly, softly. That can even be combined with the phrase line. You know, so dynamic can be very intricate. Next time you go to a performance, check out, find the dynamics. You'll be amazed what you see. You'll be amazed what you see. Here we've got the count one. If the dynamic is Loud, like strong, and smooth down. 
strong and smooth down. Here we've got smaller than normal balletic steps. So balletic steps are normally, normally over the arc. We normally walk where the foot is pointed. If you see people walking like this, it's not good. Okay. I mean, it's wrong. <laughs> you should always be walking where the foot is to over the arc of the foot from there. It goes there. And sometimes it goes further there. So you could, but then less than is actually what I'm saying now is wrong, is if the choreographer wants it, maybe he might want that. Just to walk like that, to, put the, to give a certain kind of expression to the movement. So it might be kind of a balancing act or something, to take small steps. So <coughs> the greater than is what the ballet, real balletic steps are, where they sort of walk across the stage for the Bolshoi Theatre. They say you were walking. <laughs> Greater than. And they all fall. Here we've got slight pause in the balletic walks. So those are often you see that where they go. And then they stand. But there's one kind of walk that I've never gotten used to and I never will and I will never like it. It's when they go. <laughs> and you see hundreds of people do that. You know, you walk over the straight leg. It's more elegant. And the moment you do this, you sink. Yeah. You agree. I do. <laughs> okay, so there a slight pause, so you'd be walking one, pause one. Okay. You can also identify the pause with a heartbeat. So that you say it's a one, two, it's a dazi, so one, two, three, one and two, three and one and two and three. And so you say exactly when it starts moving again. Now, if we put it into a fourth position like that, we use those for normal walks. Because when we walk, we actually, although you can argue and say you're going through something, there is a moment where both feet are on the floor. Even although the one might be already being slightly lifted, if you analyze it properly, you know, you can analyze that in finer detail, but for a normal kind of just saying, this is normal walking, we would just say we're walking from fourth to fourth to fourth to fourth to fourth. Because you always, at some point, you never, <laughs> you always have some, some, something on the floor. And here, smaller than normal walk, so you'd be going, so maybe on a tightrope, okay, here we go, this is the one I don't like, pause, pause, kids get taught like that, this is lovely, <laughs> okay, so there tells you on the T one and. T one and. T one. So you can, if you need to, if the choreographer wants to send, send it up or something or wants that in a ballet, you must know how to notate it. Okay. And personal opinions will be aside. <laughs> okay, and then the Adante, which is again uh, at a walking pace. Um, again, there it is slightly. Like it, it's just the same as the top, it was just to, to make you see it clear, because I wasn't sure if everything would show so clearly on, on the screen. Guess where we've got to? <laughs> now, we've got... So I've just got another one, that one. Why I say the step of the great hawk? Because basically that is... In 
Rehabilitation. Questa leg is lifted, 